Sequel or no sequel, it's more complicated than you might think. So I've been trying to record this video. This is probably like the 10th take of this I've done. I just can't figure out exactly how I want to explain this. SQL and NoSQL are the two sort of dominant database paradigms, and I think that they both have a lot of really, there's a lot of good to both of them, and I personally use both of them in production on InsiderViz. So my company's site, InsiderViz, if you go to our homepage, you're going to see data loaded out of a MongoDB database and data loaded out of a SQL database. I think that they're both great. I know a lot of people are going to say that's an anti-pattern, that's weird, that's dumb, why are you doing that, but the reason but we have good reason for that and I'll talk about that later, but really what I want to sort of talk about is when to use which, at least in my opinion. I think that at the end of the day, you can technically do anything with either, obviously. I think that they each fit into sort of a different category of problem. That's what I want to talk about today, and the way I think I'm going to do that, that's probably the easiest way to do this, is first, I want to talk about the like hard practical side of these things, you know, the one-to-one -one analytical comparison, the performance, the features, this and that. I want to go over that quickly as sort of a preface, but then I want to get deeper into the sort of why you would use each, because I think that's honestly more important. I think if you need the insane performance, then yeah, you're going to use DynamoDB, but that's not most people and that's not most apps. For mo most apps, it's more about the DX of your database than how quickly it can scale or how easily it can scale because at the end of the day it's more about getting something out there rather than scaling it for most things now obviously there are exceptions but if you fall under those exceptions then why are you watching this you already know the answer go do it go implement your crazy dynamo db thing go implement your crazy custom c you know go do your thing this is about the sort of general case for everyone so i figured the best place to start is with the hard one-to-one -one comparison if you want to just see my thoughts on where you should use each skip to wherever I put like here. NoSQL is, well, as it sounds, it's a database that does not use SQL as its query language. That would be MongoDB, DynamoDB, Firestore, etc. And these are typically more performant, they're more scalable, they're easier to use, they're more flexible. And in the case of like MongoDB and some of these other ones, they have really amazing aggregations, which make it super easy to do some really crazy stuff really fast with them. I know you can do the same thing in SQL, but for me personally, I find these super intuitive to work with and I really like them. I think it's worth calling out but getting back into the sort of four main points the performance the performance on a document da based database is insane i get crazy crazy speed uh in insider viz we do queries over hundreds of thousands of documents they run in like 200 milliseconds as long as they're well indexed it's insanity how fast these can go sql can obviously go super fast too but one to one typically speaking a document database is going to win out i know there are obviously exceptions to the rule but generally speaking better performance over on the NoSQL side. The scalability is crazy on NoSQL because it's so simple. You can just shard your database super easily, scale it horizontally, it's done. Nothing you really have to worry about there. SQL scaling can get more complicated, although, these days that's kind of been solved with these sort of data serverless database solutions planet scale being the most uh, prevalent one and I think probably the best one and then the ease of use of NoSQL obviously it's not obviously isn't exactly JSON, but you can think of it like a sort of JSON type structure where you're basically just loading JSON into a bucket and reading and writing out of it. There's no schema, there's no dedicated structure, just put it in and it works. Nothing you have to set up, no migrations to run, no schema, it just works. Flexibility, like I said, no schema, no migrations, it just works. But that's also the con. The con of this is there's no schema, there's no relations, there's no standards, there's no anything. You can just put whatever you want, wherever you want. I could have a document database with a collection of users and I could have two completely different user objects, put them in the same collection, it won't yell at me until my front end explodes. So something to be aware of. Then probably the biggest difference between the two is the relations. Obviously you can do pseudo joins via aggregations in NoSQL, but it's very different than it is in the SQL world. And in SQL world, these at, these relations are very well defined with um, primary keys and foreign keys built into the language. These relations are a core part of it. And it's a lot easier and a lot better to do relational transactional do relational queries and relational logic like a user to a cart to a product to a checkout session to a this to a that so much easier in SQL trying to nest that stuff in MongoDB hell it will turn into a nightmare like that imagine you have a user object with a cart and then that cart is sub nested into the user but then within that like nested array there are references to an external product 
to like an external product document and these are pointing ver uh, and these are pointing to each other with just random IDs. You have to manage these like sub nested arrays and all this stuff and it just gets insane. So much easier to deal with complex relations in SQL. If you have any solution that requires more than like a simple like if you're going if you have relations that are any deeper than like one maybe two leave no SQL behind, go to SQL. Getting into SQL, the obvious pros, mass adoption, super strong standards, and then the schemas, relations, and ORM support are sort of what sets it apart and the reason why it's industry standard. The schemas, they're great. Having a schema is a good thing. Your database is the lifeblood of your app. Personally, I wish that there was some way to set up a more robust schema in MongoDB or whatever. I know you can just set up your own types or whatever with Mongoose or something, but I find that having them built into my database and my database literally not letting me put wrong data in that's a really nice thing to have and that makes the sort of type safety from your front end to your back end to your database ensuring that your data is clean and correct it's a really nice thing to have and it's really important and one of the biggest things that i think sql does better obviously i'm sure there are some solutions that could do it in the no sql world but these are generalizations the relations in sql are the whole reason that, you know, that's why they're called relational databases, because they have relations. These relations make dealing with these complex structures, which will inevitably arise in any production level app as soon as you get past a to-do app, it's going to get complicated, and the relations make that possible. Then finally, there are ORMs. Every major language and framework has some sort of ORM that you can use. Ruby has its ORM um, in Rails. Sorry, Rails has its ORM. Django has its ORM. Uh, JavaScript world has tons of different ORMs. My personal favorite is Prisma, but that's more of a query builder, to be completely honest. But I think it's better. I think Prisma is the best. The best database experience I've ever had is on Prisma. And I think that is mostly because it effectively just instead of writing annoying SQL you just write really clean JavaScript objects and it just it just works it's hard to explain there'll be I'll talk about that more in another video but with all that said there are of course cons to SQL scalability used to be a thing again it's not really anymore we have solutions for this stuff they've figured out how to do this stuff really really well and these are 50 year old problems they're pretty well solved and scalability is not something that I would generally speaking work Generally speaking, I wouldn't worry about that too much, especially when there are solutions like Planet Scale out there, which will just do the scaling for you. That horizontal scaling, no issues whatsoever. It'll just do it. The another issue, well, again, calling this an issue is sort of hard to say, which is SQL is inflexible. You set up this schema and then you push it to your production database. If you need to do a migration to change that, it needs to do it in a clean way so that it won't destroy your data. It's much less flexible than MongoDB is where you can just add and subtract stuff randomly. You can put make a whole new collection, whole new tables, whole new databases out of nowhere, and you don't even have to create them. You can just query to that thing and then it'll just magically create them or yeah, write to that like entry or whatever. If I just wrote to a products table or if I just just wrote to a products collection regardless of whether or not that products collection already exists it'll just magically appear and it'll put all my data in there exactly as i put it versus in the sql world that's not going to happen you need to create that products table you need to migrate it into your database create all that stuff and then you can add to it so way 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 more overhead way less flexible but this also means it's safer so what you lose in speed you gain in safety which arguably safety is speed because you yeah, you can't quite go as breakneck quickly, but you probably won't break your neck. So, you know, do with that what you will. And finally, performance issues. Again, this really isn't a thing anymore. It's still worth noting that for certain for certain use cases, NoSQL is going to be better. And I think I am one of the few people who does have that use case. And I think that NoSQL is generally speaking wrong. But I think that in the cases where it's right, it's really hopefully you can kind of see why I've had to record this so many times, because like you look at these two and you put these pros and cons lists and it's like, well, yes, but it's sort of it's very nuanced in that performance is that really a benefit because you can get crazy stuff in the sequel world i mean planet scale boost just came out all this different stuff that can go really fast, too, and then. Is scalability still a thing? Is ease of use still, you know, is it really easier to use a NoSQL database? Is it really easier to, you know, all these questions are hard to answer. And it's why, you know, this sort of blog post style, just, oh, here are the pros and cons. Here's this and that. And it doesn't really work. So what I really want to get into now and sort of meat of it is where I would use each one of these. And this is more abstract. This isn't about the underlying data structures. This is about the sort of problem set that I think that these map really well to. 
So starting with SQL, let's sort of talk about the problems that SQL is really good at. SQL is good at mapping things together. If you have a problem set where you need to relate different things together, SQL makes sense. So let's do this by sort of just coming up with a random database off the top. So let's say I need to make a database here. Let's just say that this is going to be a classroom. Let's just make classroom DB. Let's just architect this off the top. So this classroom DB is going to go ahead and So we have these four collections right here. Let's go ahead and switch these to be something a little more readable. Um, yeah, let's make it that. So we have these four collections right here and we need to relate these together. So in this classroom DB, we could either throw a NoSQL solution at this or a SQL solution. So let's start with this sort of SQL solution. If we did a SQL solution, we need to create some relations here. So first and foremost, every teacher is going to have students. So every uh, teacher is going to have many students. So we can create a relation there of one teacher will point to many students. So we can do a, let's just call this a one to many. So this will be a one to many relationship where we have one teacher pointing to many students. Now we're going to go ahead and look at our students and every student is going to have one teacher. So we know, you know, one teacher to many students makes sense. Now these students are going to have tests, but the student doesn't really create the test. The student creates the test result. So the student is going to have a test result and this is actually going to be a one to one. So every test result is going to have one student to it. So we can go ahead and call this the um, one to one. So we're gonna have a one-to-one -one relationship of test result to student. Great, that all makes sense. Now this test, so in this imaginary problem, the way we do this is the teacher can then create tests, the students will take the test and get a test result. So we'll go ahead and say that every teacher is going to have many tests, but each test is only assigned to one teacher. So that means that we have, once again, a one-to-many. So we have a one-to-many relationship once more. Okay, great. Now, finally, we need to map these two together and every test is going to have many test results. So we have one last one to many. So at this point, we've sort of uh, whiteboarded out a database structure. And this makes a lot of sense for SQL because using SQL, we can easily create these relationships using primary keys and foreign keys. And if you imagine any problem set we would have, imagine we have the teacher's dashboard. We're gonna load the teacher object. That teacher object is then gonna need to figure out, okay, what students do I have in my class? It can then run a query to get all the students that are related to this teacher. And then we need to get all of their test results. So then we can just fetch um, all of these test results. And now that I'm looking at this again, this one-to-one -one should probably actually just be a one-to-many because as we descri describe that problem, this, we would have, you know, what if there are many tests? So every student needs to have many tests. So this is another one-to-many. So every student has many test results and every test has many test results, but these map back. So if we needed to say, okay, this teacher is pointing to this student and this, so yeah, so say, like I was saying earlier, we have a teacher dashboard, teacher needs to get all their students, then underneath these students, we need to see their results. So we can then reference these students to then get their test result. And then to get, once we have this test result, if we need to get some basic metadata about the test itself, we can use that relationship to its test. And you sort of see the structure here. This is a really elegant way of solving this problem and we're solving it with relations. If we tried to do this with a document-based database, we could create the same relational structure, but that's not really the point of a document-based database and doing like tons of reads and joins across multiple tables is really not the point. The point is to try and index across multiple things. So for this classroom DB, this relational structure makes a lot of sense. But now let's look at a use case that I have and let's try doing, uh, let's just look at the insider viz data set. So earlier I mentioned that I use both SQL and NoSQL in here. So the SQL part is right up here. So with this end user, the end user information is being loaded from SQL but the actual like site data itself, all of this financial data, all of these tickers, all of these trades, all of this stuff, that is being loaded from a MongoDB instance. And let me show you sort of why. So imagine over here, let's do the uh, insider viz database. So you got insider viz over here. How do I wanna architect this? So I need to keep track of form fours. So I just need a form four. So that form four, 
is going to have, if you're not familiar with insider trading, a form four is when an insider of a company makes a buy or sell or some sort of transaction on a stock that they are considered an insider for, it means that they're in a position of power or they own a certain amount of company, whatever. You get the point. So a form four is going to be an insider trading transaction. Each one of these data points on this graph, these are all form fours. These are being generated by form fours. So I have all of these different things with a form four. And what do I need to do with a form four? I need to just do a bunch of aggregations on it. It is just a data point and I have very, very shallow relations. The only things I'm relating this form for to is like maybe a ticker, but I don't even have a collection for a ticker. If you look at this form screener thing right here, this is sort of all that's in here and all of these are form fours and I don't need to, you know, I don't need to set up this whole crazy relation thing because I can just get them all out of one form four. There's no form four pointing to company, to insider, to whatever. That all just works. Now, of course, there is the thing where you could say, well, if you look on this form four, there's an insider and there's a company. So I have this sort of, I sort of have two more things here of um, the insider and the company. So I have these two extra structures over here, but how does this sort of relate to this? So obviously you might be thinking, oh, just make this a relational database because we need to point the, we just like we did before, we could point teacher to student, we could point form four to insider, form four to company. But the problem is in this use case, I need to be doing tons and tons of aggregations over massive amounts of data. Here we're just doing like, 20 like one teacher is going to have 20 students so we could maybe do 20 joins in one query not that bad like we're just finding all of the students with this and then like the joins aren't that crazy but imagine on here like look at this feed right here this api call under the hood is fetching i think 200 forms so if we had to do 200 joins here so we had to do 200 joins here 200 joins here that would get to be a huge problem so this, the sort of nesting structure is, gets really valuable here because I can go right here and I can take my company and my insider. And instead of like having all these relations, I just slide them right inside here. So now they're within this one document and for this data structure, this is okay because these don't point anywhere else. These just point to the same thing. And if I need to like go to, you know, Jenkins, Mark, David, if I go to his page, it's okay because this is actually just running a query over all of the different, um, that page or like another page like liberty media group or something so this like on sound financial corp all this stuff this is just running across the different form fours and it's just filtering it by the nested um insider and it's okay or it's filtering it by the nested company so this sort of works and it doesn't really matter that we aren't like pointing, it doesn't have its own document because we can duplicate that data to make it nested. And now obviously this is going to lead to the issue where like, if you think about it, yeah, we're duplicating this data. So like, if you looked at our underlying data structure, you would see the form four has duplicated, like every single time we're duplicating the insider and the company, but we do that for the performance gain. And the whole point of this document-based model is for performance gains, that we can run aggregations like this sector. This sector's page is being powered by several massive MongoDB aggregations, which would not be possible with SQL in any performant capacity. We would have to run it ahead of time and then cache the results every like 10 minutes or something, versus with this, we can just run it. So these, so hopefully this sort of shows you two different ways of structuring a database in the sort of way I like to think about it. The classroom DB is very similar to the reason why I use that for, um, the user profiles and stuff for insider biz. If you look at like the dashboard and stuff, I mean, you can just see the relations forming here. I have my profile pointing to my profile settings, pointing to my company watch list, pointing to my insider watch list, pointing to my subscription, all this stuff. It just makes so much more sense versus a, like where a document database would not make any sense. But then if I tried to do SQL over here, I'd have to do crazy amounts of joins on all this stuff. And I would lose some of the performance gain that I can get with a document database. So sort of the point I'm trying to make is if you can duplicate data and keep your relations super shallow, you can benefit from this. But if you can't do that and you need these complex structures, switch to a relational database and use something like Prisma to help manage that because the schema will save your freaking life. I promise it. That's take number like 10 of this. I hope that's good. I think this is probably the one I'm going to go with. I know this was very rambly and I sort of just went all over the place, but this is hopefully gives you a look into my sort of thought process and all of this stuff. Hopefully this helps. If it does, make sure you like, subscribe, do all that. If you made it this far, 
Super appreciative. Have a great day.